All right, hi everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Alan Bergstein. I am the group publisher at Penwell Corporation. Penwell, we produce uh, all sorts of business-to-business -business publications in all different areas, and uh, two of which uh, I happen to be uh, have the honor of publishing. One is Military and Aerospace Electronics. The other one is Vision Systems Design. Uh, and I've been uh, graciously asked to come here and moderate today's panel um, on advancements in machine vision, uh, particularly as they pertain to uh, what we're all here to learn about, uh, autonomous vehicles and other drones. So breakthroughs in machine vision and deep machine learning are emerging as powerful technologies for drones and robotics industries. Uh, so we brought together leaders in the vision space, as, and we'll discuss today, the latest technologies and what the future holds in this expanding market. Um, so let me introduce the panelists, and, and I'll uh, introduce all four of them, and then they'll um, individually tell you a little bit about themselves. But um, uh, first over here is uh, uh, Randall Warnas. He's the global sales manager of FLIR, FLIR Systems. Uh, next is uh, Alex uh, Harmson. He's CEO and co-founder of Virus Automation. Mike Bode is the CEO of Zymea Corporation. And uh, fourth chair, that's uh, Danny Longval, VP of Worldwide Sales for uh, Luminera Corporation. So maybe you can just... Sure. Uh, so again, I'm Randall Warnes. I run FLIR's SUAS business. So all of the efforts that we're putting into the drone space, uh, whether it's building our own cameras that can be integrated by uh, third parties or our partnerships with manufacturers uh, and software companies, so that's all run by me. As far as the machine vision side of things, we do have a, a division called Point Gray, or that was acquired, uh, Point Gray, uh, called IIS, and that is our machine vision side, but I don't know much about that, so I'm talking about more machine vision from a thermal imaging standpoint rather than a IOB standpoint. Alex Harmson, uh, CEO and co-founder of Iris Automation. We're a San Francisco-based company, and uh, we've built an electro-optical sense and avoid system. So we use RGBD sensors to be able to take in a video feed, and there's a sort of a combination of more deterministic computer vision and AI layered on top of that to be able to do 3D reconstruction, to understand the environment that we fly through, and most importantly, to detect, track, classify any moving objects in the, the air around us, specifically non-cooperative aircraft. And uh, I mean, we hope that's gonna be tremendously useful in being able to fly beyond line of sight and being able to properly integrate into the national airspace. My name is Mike Bolden from Xavier Corporation. Um, we are a camera manufacturer. We make cameras, really not much else. Um, we, or traditionally, we've been doing cameras for a scientific market and for um, uh, other uh, imagers that uh, were at the high end of, of, of imaging. Um, we moved into uh, um, industrial imaging a few years ago and um, some of the attributes of our cameras seem to be fit very well with the uh, uh, UAV market and so we've been expanding into that range and um, that's uh, basically why we're here. We have a booth upstairs. Everybody here has a booth so <laughs> you're of course welcome to visit all of us. Um, and, uh, I'm uh, Danny Lova, Vice President for Wild Sales with uh, Lumera Corporation. We're also uh, camera manufacturers. Uh, we started doing digital cameras 15 years ago now, at first for automation, uh, scientific applications, and traffic as well. A few years back, we started doing cameras for uh, UAV application, uh, engaging in a new market for us. Uh, we, we provide a technology to payload and drone manufacturers as an OEM component supplier, basically. Uh, we're also exhibiting, and uh, in our case, we see a growing market with a huge potential for more intelligent solutions. Great, okay. So, uh, uh, just a couple of uh, uh, thoughts here also is uh, we would like this to be an interactive type of a, a discussion. Uh, so, while I will have uh, many questions for uh, our panelists, I would hope that all of you would have uh, questions as well. And, at any time, we don't have to hold all the questions to the end, although we will certainly have time for that as well. But at any time, if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand, stand up, come to the microphones, and um, let's let you know have that discussion as we're going on. And 
just to make sure that we're all in an interactive mode. Can I see a show of hands? All right, good. So we know the hands work, so that's great. All right, everybody. good. So um, thank you. So first question, actually, this to the whole panel. Uh, over the next, uh, the past few years, uh, a few technologies have emerged as sort of a hot topic next generation products in the vision space. Uh, this was evident a couple weeks ago at the Vision Show in Boston, where technologies such as deep learning and multispectral hyperspectral imaging were featured prominently. What type of role do you see these technologies as having in the unmanned space? Uh Please, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, we've been in touch with uh, a number of companies who deal with AI, uh, deep learning, um, and also hyperspectral cameras. So um, my impression is that uh, both will have an impact on the AUAV field also. Um, the reason is that um, deep learning uh, can be used for a number of, of things. Uh, for example, um, when you take images with a drone, um, they can be very messy. There you have all sorts of, of objects in the field of view, and um, deep learning, artificial intelligence, may help separate those and, and segment those and, and allow a better um, reconstruction of the environment for, for, the, for the UAV. Um, and uh, hyperspectral, uh, again, I think that's very similar. Hyperspectral allows you to see objects in a different light, if you allow me to say that. <clears throat> so um, it, it may help uh, segment the, the, the visual field and, and uh, identify objects um, better than with just uh, RGB. I think over the last maybe 20, 30 years, we've seen a huge boost in computer vision applications. I think sensor technology in general is getting better and better, but you also need the matches, matching processing power. And so I think there's a lot of, we used to have to run this on supercomputers, and we're talking about millions of pixels. And I mean, recently, over the last 10 years, I think with smartphone technology, processing power, you're able to actually do that on the edge. And so you're able to use these much more complicated algorithms from everything from sort of segmentation all the way to deep learning and classification. Actually, at the edge, you're able to deploy these neural nets. And like even in a small little embedded system, you can have that sort of computational power. I think that's really changed the game in terms of computer vision, what we're able to do with sensors. A lot of the intelligence comes from this very like, feature-rich and information-rich sensors like computer vision. And I think being able to do that in software instead of in the hardware itself gives huge, huge advantages because there's so much more flexibility and a lot of the end users that are actually just using the hardware, I mean, like us, we could do, we now do design cycles in this sort of sensing space in three, four weeks rather than six, nine months for traditional hardware cycles. Yeah, and I think that, as is the interest in everyone in this room, the longevity of the, the UAS, UAV industry is important to us. And uh, with regulations always looming and, and being in question, I think that machine vision and deep learning will really unlock that longevity where it's driving too much value to be denied and it's driving too much value to be, uh, to be regulated in the way that it is now. So we're probably going to talk a lot about beyond visual line of sight and sense and avoid. And if that technology can be improved, we're all sitting here in five, 10 years from now talking about the same industry that we're talking about today rather than it being segmented off to only you know, public safety military users or something like that. I think the same can be said of multi-spectral imaging. Uh, the technology has evolved in such ways that it's a lot easier now to implement such systems. Uh, you can make it much smaller, uh, which allows people now to put those on drones and create brand new applications for, for things that your eyes cannot see. So that's a big step in the evolution of technology. Okay. So what makes UAV cameras, image sensors, and optics special? What, you know, how do they differ from components used in consumer level cameras uh, found in devices such as GoPros or mobile phones or DLSRs? So the, when you look at consumer cameras, the, the main focus is to give you a, a, a nice image, something that you look at and your eyes can appreciate. Uh, when you talk about machine vision now, you, you talk about a computer taking images as data. And there are things that the computer can see that your eyes cannot see. 
that means that you may get a fantastic looking image from a, a consumer camera saying, look, I'm machine vision, I, I, I don't understand what's different about it. Well, if you look at it with a computer now, you would see different level of uh, information that is, is invisible to your eyes. But the new algorithms need that type of information to be able to deliver on their promises. This is, I think, one of the big differences. Even just being outdoors has a lot of difference and a lot of traditional uh, traditional computer vision, where it was all sort of in, single image or indoor applications. Uh, even just being on a mobile platform means you need mobile shutter, you need higher dynamic range. It's features like this that I think have recently shot up in popularity because of all these new robotics applications. And I, I want to stress what you said. Um, most of the DLSR cameras are made to make good pictures. Um, and they do a great job at it. But uh, for example, in, in automation or in, in, in UAV, uh, there are other factors that come into play, like um, uh, how fast can I get the images, um, and so on, which, is, which puts the cameras into a different segment from, from uh, things like DLSRs and, and so on. Sure. And just, uh, I'll start the trend of not everyone answering every question, but uh, <laughs> I, I do have some thoughts there, but maybe that will break it up a bit, so go ahead. Okay. So what are, what are common camera resolutions and frame rates that are required for the various aerial image applications, such as precision agriculture, pipeline inspection, sense and avoid, simultaneous location and mapping? Well, the resolutions um, that are required are pretty much all over the place. Uh, we see people who use um, very low resolution but very fast cameras, um, as well as people who use very high resolution um, and then not that uh, cameras with not that high of a frame rate. Um, one of the things that um, limits that in many cases is the bandwidth uh, that the cameras have to transmit the data to the uh, onboard computer. Um, and I think there's there's some sub movement movement there. We we have, we're experimenting or uh, working with a direct PCIe, which has a very, very high bandwidth. Um, so there is, there is some movement there. And um, um, so I think it's, it's really more of a matter of the application, what, what is needed. I think there's, this is actually one of the, the best parts about this world, because there's so much information that comes in <coughs> through these electro-optical systems that it's really this, like what you're doing in software that, that determines the use case and determines how you're actually using that, whether that's something that's very fast and you're looking for motion, or whether you're looking at range and you need more higher resolution. And part of it is limiting, limited by the processing power, whether it's on board or in the cloud. I think another, another big part of that is just like, that there's this, this range, this scalability within this entire industry and a lot of these applications that like, has never really been seen before. And with hardware, you often build something and you have one line and you have a certain resolution, a certain distance, whatever it is. With cameras, there's so much flexibility there that the same software could be used on a range of resolutions, like orders of magnitude different, that unlock a number of different applications. So how are technology advances motivating the next generation of embedded vision systems for UAV applications? I would say the interface, to be able to interface uh, the different components of a system. Because the system is not just a camera, it's not just a payload, it's not just a processing board. It's how do you connect all these things together and turn that into something useful, both from a hardware point of view, but also from a software point of view. Uh, being able to bring in different modular and things that are by experts in their field into one working system. Sure. And I also think that when, when we're talking about hardware developments, we're not only talking about the airframe, we're, we're having longer flight times, we're having longer loft times, uh, greater payload capabilities that, to bring on more sensors, but we're also talking about uh, you know, the less processing power, less, less um, uh, suck of energy so that you can have these long duration flights to do more of these missions. So you were talking about pipeline inspection, for instance. And when we look at from thermal imaging, we need a certain resolution that is not going to be a compact camera. And so therefore, we need the hardware and the processing power to change on another and not necessarily at the sensor level. Um, so the advancements in technology will 
will unlock the, the things that we're all waiting for where this, this UAS uh, uh, industry really can explode or, or, or grow to the levels we're all expecting. I think one of the biggest changes in, in the UAS industry in general, I think over the last 10 years, is moving from the hobby space to commercial, where I think that the reliability of the systems needs to be so much higher than it's ever been before. And that, that comes down to every single component, right? There's ultimately going to be some weakest link in the system, and you don't want that to be the camera system right. or a sense of avoid solution or something that's critical to the mission itself. So what about 4K resolution? Do you see much demand for that in drone applications? And, you know, so what's driving, what's driving that? What kind of resolutions are generally required? We see 4K resolutions, yes, even 8K. Um, it, it's, again, it depends. If, if you have a higher resolution camera, you can uh, use a, a different lens, get a, a wider field of view. Um, so there is always um, something that, that uh, drives that to, um, you know, the regular stuff, bigger, wider, faster. So um, that's... Two years, we'll see 36K, right? I mean, it's really 36K, 30K. at the moment, yeah, 36K is uh, usually a multi-camera system. Um, but that's another uh, uh, technology that is coming and that, that uh, will drive this, this feed forward. But there's need to be careful about it because you go from 4K, 8K and go up, but you don't necessarily need more resolution all the time. And often you see that in the consumer industry, like the more the better. Well, that's not necessarily the case. You have to do to match to your needs. And if you don't, you're going to end up with other problems. You're going to end up with problems under processing side of things, because larger images only need more processing power to, to, to resolve. So it's about fitting uh, the right technologies to the right application. It's not even just, the, the processing is a huge part of that. I mean, processing power is increasing, but it's also storage, it's transmitting. Exactly, yeah. One of the biggest problems that we have, we have something like 30 or 40 terabytes of data at our headquarters, and we're continuously running automated tests against that. But backing that up is a huge pain. We need fiber connections. I mean, even transferring that between our offices, being able to take field data, collecting raw video from customers. We're talking about sending like 500 gigabyte hard drives back and forth to people. Yeah. It's just all these other issues yeah, that come from that higher resolution. Yeah, that's right. From a camera point of view, if you go to higher resolution, but the pixel gets smaller. As it gets smaller, they become less sensitive. Maybe that's a problem for you. Maybe you want bigger pixel instead. Well, do you think the advent of the Intel Skylake processors with DisplayPort resolutions that now do support 4K resolutions up to 60 frames per second will increase the use of 4K resolution in UAV applications? Uh, I think it will because uh, if you collect 4K images, and, and a lot of people use their laptop to, to look at the results of what they collect. And if that limits you what you can see, actually you don't benefit from collecting so much data. Uh, the fact that it's being available, actually just that will drive the demand. We talked a little bit about uh, uh, interfaces. So vision systems rely on camera interfaces such as camera link, coax press, USB, and, and uh, gigabit ethernet for transferring image data to the processor for analysis. What's the most common camera interface used in UAV applications today, and why is that? I think that's your space. Yeah, yeah exactly. you're the one using the camera. Right? <laughs> I, I was talking with all three of these before how this isn't really a solved problem. I and mean, there seems to be issues with sort of every different interface, and I think it's sort of an industry-wide problem. I mean, USB 3 has a lot of EMI issues, and USB 2 doesn't have the bandwidth. Ethernet cables, you don't really want that running through your drone because it's heavy and sort of overkill. I mean, issues with CSI where you can't transmit over large distances. It's, and we've gone through a lot of different cameras and we're continuously trying to find the best, most scalable way to be able to do that sort of transmission. And it's, I mean, that's transmission on board from the camera itself, wherever it's placed. I mean, it could be in a wing, could be in the front of the nose, could be on top somewhere to like our processing core on board and then transmitting that down to the ground or over large distances is an entirely different problem. And so we're talking about potentially dedicated radios or trying to, for us, as I think we've taken the approach where 
we want to do as much processing as possible on board so that we're not constrained by the communication down to the ground, or to at least do enough processing on board where you could take some sort of avoidive action or take that decision and then pass sort of relevant information to the autopilot or the pilot on the ground that doesn't need to be real time or doesn't need to be flight critical. I think, like, I think a lot of the industry is moving towards that. If you can offload a lot of that processing power to the onboard applications, then you're not constrained in terms of beyond visual line of sight flights, so you're not constrained to the C2 link. Uh, or sort of transmitting over large distances like that, because I mean, as I mean, as optimistic as I want to be about like coverage across the U.S., we're still a long way from coverage in mining and oil and gas and agricultural and forestry and search and rescue use cases, which are mostly away from urban centers, and it's going to take a while to get 4G there, let alone 5G or LTE. One thing we discussed was maybe the opportunity to actually create something unique to the industry, some interface that we designed specifically for the challenges we see in that market. That would involve a lot of different people. <laughs> it's difficult to come up with something that this will, will adopt. But maybe with a few good leaders, we can make it happen. Are there standards committees that would be able to address this? Uh, yeah, I think we can learn from the committees we see in other industries, like in the machine design industries, for example. Uh, on the networking industries, for example, that we could bring to the table and try to define something. Um, but for now, in the meantime, I, I think what you want to have is something which is easy to use. So you have all different components, you have the processors, right? On those, you have a certain selection of interfaces that are available. You see the USB 2 and 3, you see the internet interfacing, you see the PCIe also. Those are all good choice because then you can get components that can all work together. If you go with something a bit more esoteric, uh, where you need frame grabbers and things, well, that's a bit more complicated. And unless you really need to go that, this way, uh, I don't recommend it. Sure. And uh, let me just say one thing about, I don't want to sound too commercial, <laughs> but uh, uh, I just want to say a word about that PCIe interface. Um, it, it is um, spec for optical data transmission, which would alleviate a lot of the problems that you're seeing. So. Um, while it is an unproven interface for UAV, I, I, I totally agree. Um, it is something that um, is maybe uh, able to alleviate some of, some of these problems. Yeah, and we're going to continue to explore that. I think ultimately we want some sort of standard, and I mean, ideally we just buy something off the shelf. I mean, I'm, I mean, Iris is really the only sort of pure software company here. And like we are very happy to just sell software licenses if the camera issues, if the processing issues get figured out by the rest of the industry. And I think in general, the entire UAS industry will benefit from just being able to pick, pick up and place components and bring those things together. And the more that moves into the software realm, I think the better. Are there any of the challenges of integrating the next generation embedded vision systems into an unmanned or a drone application? I think that it's the same for everyone where it's resolution, weight, processing power, right? Yeah. Those but are all the challenges. These things, yeah. All these things are getting better. Physical things. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's a huge advantage already. Oftentimes, uh, I mean, our, our systems are compared to radar systems or I mean, other types of systems like that, even LiDAR, being able to have such a low cost, size, weight, and power is a tremendous benefit. And like, ultimately, I think it's the, the smartphone revolution, it's factory automation that's driven a lot of that miniaturization, brought the cost down tremendously low, where we're talking about orders of magnitude different in terms of production quantities. And that's, I, I think that's one of the reasons why we so, we're working with electro-optical sensors and why we see so many more applications like that, even across multispectral imaging, egg, I mean, all of the, all of our customers that use cameras for their own sort of surveying, processing, I mean, they're touting the exact same sort of benefits of cameras of this type of image sensing. Yeah, and I think that we're, we're all here together talking about one industry and sharing best practices, but really, we, no one really knows what works. This industry is still relatively new, and you have hearsay about you know, LiDAR changing the game in one area, but we need to share those things and, and keep people accountable for what they're throwing out in the industry, because 
uh, unless you test it yourself, maybe you don't believe it. And that's, that's what makes this industry tough at this point. Uh, what about active stabilization technologies? They're typically deployed to counteract vibration and improve image quality. How do they affect what you're working on? There's different ways to, to do this, and we have customers that try to use uh, optics-based type of stabilization. And, and what the issue they, they run into is, is just reliability. Uh, the, that thing just doesn't last long enough to, for, for most applications. It was great in a consumer camera, but not so much in a UV setting. So I, I think a software-based approach, an image processing-based approach, is it, probably better for this space, where now you have intelligence in the back end that would look at this collection of images and be able to cancel out the vibration. Um, how are camera, cameras uh, typically triggered in UAV applications? How are they triggered? Um, well, usually cameras are triggered either through software or through an external trigger. Um, and both um, systems are used in, in, in UAVs. Um, external trigger just requires a, usually a voltage pulse to trigger uh, the camera to acquire images. Um, and there's sometimes uh, additional information that can be transmitted that way. Um, software triggering is easier to implement because you don't need an extra cable to the, to the camera, but uh, um, it's a little bit more um, unreliable because it runs through the CPU and you don't know what the CPU is doing at the, at the time. So, yeah. uh, good. We've got uh, two questions here. before we get too far away from the topic. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a discussion about the, the bandwidth and the connection from the camera to the processing system and the rest of the drone uh, subsystems. Have you looked at things from automotive like two-wire Ethernet, broader reach, and then maybe even extending it because such a, since you're talking about such a small distance, right, you could change the properties of the, you know, the, the transmission so that you can put higher and higher bandwidth since you're only trying to go over a small distance. Is, are those the kind of things that you're trying to consider or you want to try and standardize or do you see anything that's already being used in the other industries that are going to solve it? We've, well, we've spent a lot of time looking at what self-driving car companies are doing and other companies in the automotive space, even for sort of lane detection or anything like this. But a lot of it, I mean, the EMI, EMI isn't really constrained. It's usually there's not weight constraints on the cables. You're able to put repeaters in different places. Uh, I mean, ultimately, I think one of the one of the core standards that like we really like, but it's not really feasible, is things like CSI, which is specifically built for smartphones. Mm -hmm. But then you have transmission distances of ten to twenty centimeters, which is yeah, <laughs> somewhere it's between, short within right? the drone itself, <laughs> but that's too short for really what we want to be able to do, especially if we're running it down the wing or like onto a boom or something like that. So would you just would you want to take those die triple and put it in NATO too? Subgroup, or how, how do, are you going to leverage the Ethernet community to develop those standards based upon standard or existing protocols? Or are you going to want to do it within ASTM or you know the drone industry? Which which path do you think is most likely or successful? And of course, you're a software we, company, but <laughs> yeah, we've like, we've gotten pretty involved in RTCA and ASTM for some of the, the regulatory stuff, and specifically for sense and void systems. And I think that's a really useful process for for going down those routes. When it comes to like this sort of specifications, we haven't dived too deep into like some of these types of standard bodies. My initial guess, or like my my understanding, is that maybe that just takes too long to to go through, and maybe the sort of a few companies that come together that work with camera manufacturers to define sort of a specific new standard or take something that currently exists, something like CSI, paralyze or serialize that uh, to extend that over longer period, longer distances. I mean, we want those applications now, right? We like we are already selling these systems, and we want those things to be fixed, and we want them to be fixed in a proper way, and so. Maybe the parallel efforts where there's sort of these smaller industry groups trying to fix that, and then at the same time you have these uh, these larger efforts with sort of standard standardization bodies. Yeah, and so then a uh, second question that's a little bit different, which is you talked about resolutions, frame rates, and of course trying to constrain the amount of processing and bandwidth, especially if it's going to go 
uh, over the command and control. One of the things in automotive that we've talked about is uh, you may have m a very wide you know, uh, field of view when you're going slow because you've got a lot more going on. And so, you know, and then as you go faster, you can change the field of view and then you can adjust the frame rate and resolution accordingly because you mean, if you're going really super fast, you might need a faster frame rate because there's more going on between frames versus if you're slow, you want a wide field of view. Are you looking at the same kind of trade-offs in, in drones? Um, something, I mean, something like digital zoom could be very useful in applications like this, where especially if you're a processor constrained. I mean, you could have a very high resolution camera come in and then the first step in your processing pipeline could just be cut it down to something that's much more useful until you find an area that an area of interest or some yeah. something that's worth focusing on and you just open up a certain ROI, like a certain region of interest in that specific area of the image where you can blow it up dynamically to get more resolution. Right, and, what, and what's on board used for processing versus what's sent down over command and control could be radically different. Exactly, right. uh, yeah. especially if you're doing that in the cloud, especially if you're doing that in some sort of computer off-board, I mean, there's, there's a big difference between real-time applications and uh, more the sort of post-processing, trying right. to do analysis, whether that's crop analysis or pipeline inspection, railway inspection, whatever it is. One neat way that I've seen to address that is to mimic the human eyes, actually, where in the center of your image, yeah. you focus on that portion of the image, so you invest your processing power into that section, and what's more peripheral, you don't process to the same extent uh, uh, unless you trigger something yeah. that, oh, I should be looking at this. Thanks. But um, so I had a question regarding the conversation you had before about LiDAR. Um, I think recently Sky Dio has done a very good job of utilizing cameras instead of LiDAR to sense and navigate through very unique and difficult environments. From your guys' perspective, do you think that this throws a wrench in LiDAR, or do you still think that LiDAR will be the future um, that we should be focusing on when it comes to sense and avoid? Yeah, so I, I'm probably the least uh, qualified to answer that question, but since I haven't been saying anything, we're talking about ADAS and what we're losing, what we're learning about from the ADAS world to translate to the UAS. Is ADA, autonomous driving is, um, the, the demand is there, it's proven out, so everyone's driving towards it, but we're still learning lessons. LiDAR will be amongst the suite of sensors within ADAS systems where thermal even has a role and we have machine vision, we have LiDAR, we have other sensors. The problem is, is that we need compactability and then we need processing power on an airframe. So lessons learned, yeah, if we're choosing one for sensitive void, it could be LiDAR, it could be machine vision, but we're not, we don't have the um, capability at this point to have the whole suite. And that's why there are two different worlds is we have to choose one or two. Cost is a big part of that as well, right? That's probably the, one of the main drivers in terms of choosing LiDAR or choosing computer vision. I think uh, I mean, there's a fair amount of companies now, Intel, DJI, Skydio, that are starting to come out with computer vision products specifically to do collision avoidance, show short range detection. A lot of that is driven by stereo approach. And so you're trying to compare two images and trying to get depth sensing from that. Very useful. I think in general, like, it's great for those companies to start pioneering that, to pave the way, because I think there's still this, like especially in the aviation world, there's still this hesitance around using cameras, using uh, on, sort of on port processing. There's a certain amount of intelligence that's needed. Even if it's fairly deterministic and we're creating these geometric representations, there's still this the hesitance there. They're still like, oh, I want more proof points, even though radar has been used for a long time. I think LiDAR is the same sort of issues. I think one of the issues with LiDAR, especially when we're going longer range, is that uh, you run into eye safe issues. And especially with this much power being transmitted over those ranges, I mean, you need uh, exponentially more power the longer you go. And so where, where it might be really useful for consumer drones or prosumer drones, it's not nearly as useful for going beyond line of sight, flying uh, I mean, hundreds of kilometers, or flying in national airspace, dealing with other moving targets. But I think there's, like, with the increased resolution, 
there's all this new information that you get from computer vision systems, which is why I don't think there's a single self-driving car company out there that isn't using computer vision as part of their sensor suite. Just because it, the, because there's so much resolution, so because there's so much information, partly just because the world is built for vision, which is, which is great for all of us. I mean, there's, I think there's just this intuitive understanding of the world through vision that we can leverage because every all these rules are set up for humans, for human eyes, and like in some ways, what we're trying to do is just improve on the Mark One eyeball. Yeah. I've seen it in other industries, a similar shift, and maybe we'll see this here too as well. Uh, shifting from LiDAR to optical based uh, 3D solutions, mostly like you said, because they're cheaper also, and, and they do right. the job now because they've evolved so much and, and they keep you know, improving all the time. Thank you. Another question here? Yeah, since, uh, since we've been doing questions, I figured I'd jump in now and I'm kind of tailored to what you're already talking. Uh, Alex Parker, uh, U.S. Coast Guard, a simple helicopter pilot that just got recently thrown into UAS stuff. So, uh, but one of the you know, future visions of UAS within the Coast Guard that has direct applicability to what we're talking about is uh, search and rescue missions and how you identify, if you've flown over an area, if you have identified whether there's a person in the water there or not. And that's one of the things that we're struggling with in relation to the soda straw, you know, of you know, the existing kind of systems we have on some of our helicopters. And our prior research and development company, corporation, or center, excuse me, has done testing where they looked at you know, some infrared systems and established a probability of detection matrix. But they said, hey, we're not going to look at visual at that time because the Mark 1 eyeball is so much better. Um, so I was kind of curious, when you're going forward with machine vision, um, it's mostly more of a problem than a question, I guess, but how would you be able to identify whether you were able to detect something in that machine vision algorithms um, in such a way that you can go back to you know, a legal entity, the government, and then also to the people to say, hey, we flew over that part, patch of ocean and there was no one there. Advice, you know, a family coming back and saying, hey, you missed something. So. Yeah. In, in machine vision, actually, being an automation background, there's a lot of different ways to do detection of all kinds of things. And, and you would be thinking that a lot of that knowledge and the technology would be portable to such an applications. But the difference is that in automation, you control everything. <laughs> you control the environment. You can set things up in a way that you're going to detect at very high accuracy level. I agree that in that type of situation, it's a lot harder to come up with a reliable way of doing this and, and, and to go to the point to be legally binded to your result, I think that's a, quite a bit of a stretch today. Yeah, and I was going to say um, you might want to try uh, deep learning, but that's probably not uh, compatible with the legal requirements that you have because it's, it's, it's not clear what, what, uh, how, you, how you, uh, the system would detect that. Uh, I mean, I can, I can speak to some of the things that we're doing maybe as an example. I don't want to sound like a, a commercial, but uh, I mean, we've gone through a lot of the same sort of validation efforts, uh, especially because it's relatively new technology, because there, there is a lot of distrust out there. Uh, and I think, so we, on our team, we have a fair amount of people from the self-driving car world, and there's people from the avionics world. And so the, the two have sort of created this, this test program where we said, we want to do real manned aircraft testing where we're flying a manned aircraft, we put drones into the air, we're putting, we're actually creating hundreds of collision scenarios every single month when we do that testing. And this was sort of the baseline test that we needed to do to actually understand, have full ground truth, be able to prove that the system actually works in those different environments. But I mean, we want to work with different lighting and different weather and different types of aircraft. And there's ultimately millions and millions of combinations. And so we did a lot of thinking and tried to figure out how can we sort of step it up. I mean, we could pour millions of dollars into our testing program and expand that, but probably not a good use of money. And so we decided to invest in building our own simulated environments. And so we've built this very visually real simulated environment where we've added things in like, I mean, vehicle dynamics is sort of like a baseline there, but we've had to add in things like lens glare. We've had to add in things like atmospheric effects with different weather patterns. Even, 
Like the, the way that the, the light reflects off a helicopter uh, cabin, the plexiglass. I mean, you want to model those things into that simulated environment and then use the real testing to actually actually validate the simulated environments. I think like ultimately when we're talking about doing this sort of validation, there's going to be so many different edge cases that you encounter and the only way to do that is through these sorts of simulated hours. We're running tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of trials every single week just to be able to work through those individual edge cases. And I think there has to be a certain expectation that this system doesn't catch everything. Right? We will never be able to build an autonomous system that works 100% of the time. And so we need to define some level of safety or some standard, whether it's search and rescue or sense and avoid, that is acceptable. Just like we've done with humans. Right? There's a certain acceptable number of crashes on the road with cars. There's a certain acceptable misroute rate when we're doing search and rescue missions. And so the idea is to, to get better every single year. And like, based on all the testing that we've done and all the research that we've seen, the Mark 1 eyeball is actually not that good. And like, they're on top of that, there's a lot of distraction. There's a lot of area to cover. Humans get tired. I mean, humans abuse substances. Humans just aren't vigilant all the time, especially in, in aircraft. They're on the radio, and they're dealing with passengers, and they're actually flying the aircraft, and they're navigating and looking at the cockpit. And so, I mean, I think when it comes to validation and like these different types of applications, part of it is just doing it and proving that the system worked, comparing that to ground truth data, and part of it is accepting that there is some sort of standard there that we need to meet and keep raising the bar on that. And I want to contradict myself really quick that uh, that requires multiple sensors, in my mind. Search and rescue, when you need to be certain, it wouldn't just be machine vision through RGB sensors. You using IR already, uh, me coming from the IR world, I think that thermal plays a huge role in, in search and rescue. And one thing that we're adding in the world of uh, commercial drones uh, and, and building technology for the masses is we added something recently with the new Zen Music C2 with DJI called Temple Arm. And now it's basically taking in radiometric data, temperature data, real time, and it's processing that. And when there's something that breaches a certain temperature anywhere within that scene, it's going to alert you. So you could fly over this area with a thermal imaging camera, and it's not using machine vision. It's just using reading zeros and ones and saying when something gets too hot, when something is beyond uh, in, in the water, if you're seeing something that's living, it, it will alert you. And, and that's something that machine vision can validate uh, but you wouldn't just use one or the other. Ultimately, I mean, the, every single sensing modality has drawbacks, and so if you fuse those different sensing modalities together, if you do that sensor fusion, you're going to make a much more reliable system. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Back to you, Al. Back to me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I've actually got questions that I'm going to send right back to you guys. So uh, let's start with uh, uh, with Randall. Uh, again, global sales manager for FLIR Systems. What are some of the limitations or risks of deploying thermal imaging capabilities on drone? And how can these be addressed? Sure, so that's exactly to the search and rescue scenario. It's the public safety is our number one consumer of, of thermal imaging drones today. And uh, you need to be sure that you have, you have seen your target if that's what you're looking for. And there can't be uh, false negatives. Um, so resolution is our biggest uh, challenge. Uh, right now is a 640 by 512 resolution thermal imaging camera is considered high resolution. It's at a price point that is acceptable by the uh, drone industry, but it's not great. Um, and getting beyond that to where you can have more of that, uh, more of that, I guess, reliability uh, is going to be difficult. So that's really where it comes is that if you trust in thermal, it needs to work all the time. And now it means you have to fly lower to get more pixels on target. There's issues with some of that with terrain. So we're, we're working through that. That will just be engineers that, uh, that we funnel information into. To, to push it. And, and what are some of the other interesting ways, if you're allowed to talk about any of sure. that you've seen thermal cameras deployed in drones? Yeah, so uh, outside of public safety, uh, utility inspection, solar inspection is going to be pretty obvious. But the really interesting stuff is where we're 
doing things with anti-poaching or with wildlife preservation. Um, we work with a, a nonprofit called Ocean Alliance, which you may have seen uh, the TV show Well Wars. Um, that's the Sea Shepherd version. That's the, the or Sea Shepherd division of that, where it's activism. But this is more in understanding uh, ecology uh, in the ocean. So uh, we're actually going this summer to get the first radiometric reading of a whale's blowhole and whether that temperature means anything, if you could detect whether it's pregnant or sex or if it's sick, that's, we don't know. But that's physically was something that was impossible without using a combination of thermal imaging and something that's invasive like a UAV platform. So those kind of things pop up uh, from time to time and, and give us a, a new frontier to venture into. Uh, Mike, again, CEO of uh, Zymia. So uh, your company develops a lot of different products for different applications. What are some of the products that were developed specifically for drones and robotics, and how did they come to be? Well, the, as, as I mentioned, we have been making cameras for 25 years, so we have a, a, a long history of making cameras. Um, we moved into the uh, automation uh, segment a few years ago, and it turns out that uh, what we are trying to do and what we are doing uh, intersects very well with the uh, UAV uh, segment. Um, that is um, lightweight cameras, small cameras um, with standard interfaces. Um, we are very concerned about latency. We, we try to make the cameras as responsive as possible. Um, so that was a, a sort of like a natural uh, path for us into the UAV. UAV market. Um, we um, have expanded on that and with, with um, interfaces to the TX2 and, and so on so that we can sort of start developing uh, payloads. Um, the, I think uh, the, uh, there, there's always new sensors on the market. There, Sony and all the sensor manufacturers, they're pushing the envelope and they're making new sensors, bigger sensors, uh, faster sensors. Um, and we had uh, an issue with that, that there was not a, a, um, an interface that would allow it to carry the data to the computer. And so that's, um, we have, we decided that at some point we tried that PCIe that I already mentioned a couple of times. Um, and it turns out that is, is also uh, very good for um, many of the, the, the parameters that, that the UAV market is looking for like latency. Um, um, so um, the, uh, we, are, we now have a, uh, a program to develop the uh, more, going more into the UAV market, develop some um, um, payloads, and um, that's essentially how we got into this and where we are now. Uh, Danny, uh, Vice President of Worldwide Sales for Luminera. So, your company and you've built an expertise in imaging technology uh, designed specifically for rugged, mission-critical environments. Uh, and while you were recently focused on advanced machine vision technologies, your previous assignments included research and design projects for fighter and reconnaissance aircraft electronic technologies. Um, when did you know as a company that drones and robotics would become a focus area for you? That probably goes back about five or six years ago. The, the way we actually ran into this is because a lot of our customers at the time were uh, scientists, universities, lab, military, uh, buying cameras from us to support their scientific research. And those were the people working on, on, on new unmanned vehicle systems. They were testing new concepts, building new things, publishing papers. And as we were doing quite a few of those, we were looking at, hey, it's quite possible that some of that you know, early research is going to find its way into a, a, an actual growing market at some point. So we decided to invest a bit more. <laughs> and, and we were pretty early on at the time. And uh, we, we, we kept investing, we kept going. And I, I think we made the right choice because now we see the returns of that. And we do see an industry which is very vibrant. Uh, that's a bit of the history on how we got into this. What do you think are some of the next generation products or capabilities that help to propel drones, robotic applications to the next level in terms of vision capabilities? Yeah, we, we've touched a bit on, on one of those in our conversation earlier today. Uh, I think 3D imaging is probably one of the next one that's going to uh, contribute to the industry and other industries as well. 
uh, is the result of, again, new technology evolving, being able to do more processing so you can collect data from stereoscopic sensors and, and create uh, high precision, reliable 3D images now. And, and when it comes to UAV, you can use that for all kinds of different things. Like in agriculture, for example, you can monitor the height of the plants as you, as you fly above. Or for 3D mapping, which now involves like multiple cameras or complex systems. Uh, so this is going to get a lot easier. This is going to get a lot smaller also. Uh, which uh, is going to open up new possibilities. And uh, for you, Alex, uh, and CEO of Iris Automation, a high-tech startup uh, building computer vision collision avoidance systems for industrial drones. Uh, cameras alone, of course, are not enough for robust sense and avoid or drone collision systems. What technologies do you see as necessary for a complete system? I actually disagree with that. I think cameras alone <laughs> are good enough. I mean, essentially, if we're talking about replacing the, the Mark I eyeball, and I feel like we're already at the point where we've surpassed that, and like very often we're able to detect things that human pilots aren't. I mean, very often we have all of these issues that I mentioned before where humans are just distracted and there's all kinds of other issues, and luckily our software doesn't get distracted in the same way. I think. In general, uh, maybe it's just a misconception in general that like using cameras like won't give us the right sort of reliability, or it won't give uh, distance. I, mean, I think very often people come up to us and they ask us like, "How are you doing range?" Or it's all passive sensing, and I'm just like we just talked about. I mean, the three D there's three D reconstruction that's been happening for years and years and years. I mean, for us, we do things a little bit differently, but not that differently than humans do it. I mean, if I'm a pilot, without any other sensing modalities besides my eyes, I'm able to see other aircraft around me, and I'm able to estimate the range to those aircraft and predict different uh, closing speeds. And oh, part of it is relative, part of it is depending on motion, part of it is dependent on the context of the environment. Where I'm flying, what the other aircraft looks like, I mean, it's, it's easy to see the difference between, between a helicopter and an aircraft, but humans actually have a terrible time at identifying naturally where those are. If you have a always-on camera system that's continuously looking out from the aircraft, there's huge benefit to that, especially at the sort of ranges that we're capable of doing. I think it's, like we were talking about before, it's useful to other, add other sensing modalities. I think there's like there's forever holes in in every single system, but I would be I would be shocked if like anyone can, else can prove that there's another sensing modality that's more effective than computer vision right now. And I mean we've integrated ADSB into our system. I mean we're going to integrate UTM, and when radar comes low enough, we will integrate that. And infrared once that once the cost drops and the resolution improves, I mean it's better to fuse in all those different systems as well, but I think the core system will always be computer vision just because of the amount of data that's coming through, because of the reliability of those types of systems, and because of the applicability to what is currently allowed in aviation, what's currently allowed in self-driving cars and in marine applications. I, um, if I can complicate that question a little bit more, so just concerning like taking off and landing autonomously in an environment, an unknown environment where maybe there's trees or power lines or an urban setting, or even just trying to fly through like urban canyon type of setting. Um, so does that argument still hold if, if you have conditions like low feature um, places, like if you have white wall on both sides of you, for example, or if it's nighttime, or if there's fog that comes in or something like that? Do you you still stick with that argument. Yeah. That, that, excuse me, that computer version is the only thing that you need. Or do you think there is a roadmap for only being able to do it with only computer vision rather than having other sensors? I think this is a, this is a fantastic question. I think, uh, like I'll preface that in saying Iris Automation like, isn't really focusing on the landing and departure part of things. Usually, each individual operator, like either the operator is there at the ground station, or there's some other automated system, there's sort of automated 
battery charging systems, there's systems that come down and land autonomously. But one of the companies I used to work at, I built a computer vision landing system for them. And we had tremendous success with that. I think ultimately, we have, there's, there's issues with GPS, there's canyon effect, especially if you're flying in cities, or there's mountains around. Very often you can't get radio signals, it's very hard to triangulate exactly where you are. Um, the, the other, I mean, there's, there's other sensors. I think uh, when we're close to the ground, when we're dealing with relatively short distances, I mean, there's radar altimeters, there's uh, sonar that's useful. I mean, it's, I think it's much easier to pull in other systems. Uh, I think when you want the flexibility to do long range and short range, the only way to do that is using computer vision and to actually change those distances and change the algorithms that you're using in software. And so, like, I think the, the versatility there like, is really with computer vision, with electro-optical systems, but like, the way things are actually happening, sort of the way that they're playing out, there's probably gonna be unique like, arrival departure procedures just because you, that's a more controlled airspace, or that's a controlled, more controlled maneuver, and so it doesn't really make sense to use the same sort of sense and avoid technology for that. Great. Other questions from out here? So I just want to uh, ask one last question again, which is, what's the next big thing? Just kind of quickly, you know, one sentence. Beyond yeah, visual line of sight is going to be what makes it worth everyone being here. So that will be the next big thing in my opinion. Bob, my guess would be um, fully autonomous UAV um, with uh, integrated, uh, obviously integrated uh, all sorts of sensors and uh, possibly even uh, artificial intelligence on board. And maybe two steps ahead. <laughs> I should agree with that. That's, uh, I think the shift we're seeing now is going from an unmanned system to autonomous system, thanks to the intelligence we can put in the system. So, onboard decision making. Yeah, I think uh, there's so many things running through my head and so many different things. And I, mean, I think uh, ultimately, beyond visual line of sight, in my mind, is actually like f flying further than a mile away from the operator. Or and or scaled operations where it's more than one drone per operator, and it's like actually autonomous systems where you just have a box on someone's farm field and the drone just takes off every Monday morning and does a survey or something like that, where there's really no human intervention and it's really just helping make that system more productive. I think it's those three things it's all sort of all fall into the beyond visual line of sight category. Sure. That's my one thing. <laughs> Those three things are your one thing. I love this field. There's just there's so much. And interesting, nobody said battery. We don't control that. Right. We're not going to talk about that. Well, um, I want to thank our panelists. You did a great job, I think. I mean, Thanks. Give them a hand. All right. uh, thank all of you who came here. And uh, we're going to hang out for a couple of minutes. If you want to come up and have any questions, um, please do so. If not, have a good show. Thanks, everybody.